Okay. That's right. We are reading Journey to the Center of the Earth, Chapter 17, Deeper and Deeper, The Coal Mine. In truth, we were compelled to put ourselves upon rations. Our supply would certainly last no more than three days. I found this out about supper time. The worst part of the matter was that, in what is called the transition rocks, it was hardly to be expected we should meet with water. I had read of the horrors of thirst, and I knew that were we, where we were, a brief trial of its sufferings would put an end to our adventures and our lives. But it was utterly useless to discuss the matter with my uncle. He would have answered by some axiom from Plato. During the whole of, of next day, we proceeded on our journey through this interminable gallery. Arch after arch, tunnel after tunnel, we journeyed without exchanging a word. We had become as mute and reticent as Hans, our guide. The road had no longer an upward tendency. At all events, if it had, it has, was not to be made out very clearly. Sometimes there could be no doubt that we were going downwards. But this inclination was scarcely to be distinguished and was by no means reassuring to the professor because the character of the strata was in no wise modified and the transition character of the rocks became more and more marked. It was a glorious sight to see how the electric light brought out the sparkles in the wall of the calcareous rocks and the old red sandstone. One might have fancied oneself in one of those deep cuttings in Devonshire, which have given their name to this kind of soil. Some magnificent specimens of marble projected from the sides of the gallery, some of an agate gray with white veins of variegated character, others of a yellow spotted color with red veins. Farther off might be seen samples of color in which cherry-tinted seams were to be found in all their brightest shades. The greater number of these marbles were stamped with the marks of primitive animals. Since the previous evening, <coughs> nature and creation had made considerable progress. Instead of the rudimentary tri trilobites, I perceived the remains of a more perfect order. Among others, the fish in which the eye of a geologist has been able to discover the first form of the reptile. The Devonian seas were inhabited by a vast number of animals of the species this species, which were deposited in tens of thousands in the rocks of new formation. It was quite evident to me that we were ascending the scale of animal life, of which man forms the summit. My excellent uncle, the professor, appeared not to take notice of these warnings. He was determined at any risk to proceed. He must have been in expectation of one of two things, either that a vertical well was about to open up under his feet, and thus allow him to continue his descent, or that some insurmountable obstacle would compel us to stop and go back by the road we had so long traveled. But evening came again, and to my horror, neither hope was doomed to be realized. On Friday, after a night, when I began to feel the gnawing agony of thirst, and when in consequence appetite decreased, our little band rose and once more followed the turnings and windings, the ascents and descents of this interminable gallery. All were silent and gloomy. I could see that even my uncle had ventured too far. After about ten hours of further progress, a progress dull and monotonous to the last degree, I remarked that the reverberation and reflection of our lamps upon the sides of the tunnel had singularly diminished. The marble, the schist, the cal alcerous rocks, the red sandstone had disappeared, leaving in their places a dark and gloomy wall, somber and without brightness. We had reached a remarkably narrow part of the tunnel. I leaned my left hand against the rock. When I took my hand away and happened to glance at it, it was quite black. We had reached the coal strata of the central earth. A coal mine, I cried. A coal mine, and without miners, responded my uncle, a little severely. How can we tell? I can tell, replied my uncle, in a sharp doctrinal tone. I am perfectly certain that this gallery, through the successive layers of coal, was not cut by the hand of man, 
But whether it is the work of nature or not is of little concern to us. The hour for our evening meal has come. Let us sup. Hans, the guide, occupied himself in preparing food. I had come to that point when I could no longer eat. All I cared about were the few drops of water which fell to my share. What I suffered, it is useless to record. The guide's gourd, not quite half full, was all that was left for us three. Having finished their repast, my two companions laid themselves down upon the, their rugs and found in sleep a remedy for fatigue and suffering. As for me, I could not sleep. I lay counting the hours until morning. <clears throat> the next Sunday, at six o'clock, we started again. Twenty minutes later, we suddenly came upon a vast, vast excavation. From its mighty extent, I saw at once that the hand of man could have had nothing to do with this coal mine. The vault above would have fallen in. As it was, it was only held together by some miracle of nature. This mighty natural cavern was about a hundred feet wide by a hundred and fifty feet high. The earth had evidently been cast apart by some violent subterranean commotion. The mass, giving way to some prodigious upheaving of nature, had split in two, leaving the vast gap into which we inhabitants of the earth had penetrated for the first time. The whole singular history of the coal period was written on those dark, glooming walls. A geologist would have been able to easily follow the different phases of formation. The seams of coal were separated by strata of sandstone, a compact clay which appeared to be crushed down by the weight from above. At that period of the world, which preceded the secondary epoch, the earth was covered by a coating of an enormous and rich vegetation. Due to the double action of tropical heat and perpetual humidity, a vast atmospheric cloud of vapor surrounded the earth on all sides, preventing the rays of the sun from ever reaching it. Hence the conclusion that these intense heats did not arise from the new source of caloric. Perhaps even the star of day was not quite ready for its brilliant work to illumine a universe. Climates did not as yet exist, and a level heat pervaded the whole surface of the globe, the same heat existing at the North Pole as at the equator. Whence did it come? From the interior of the Earth? In spite of of all the learned theories, Professor Hardwig, a fierce and vehement fire certainly burned within the entrails of the great spheroid. Its action was felt even to the topmost crust of the earth, the plants and then in existence being deprived of vivifying rays of the sun had neither buds nor flowers nor odor, but their roots drew a strong and vigorous life from the burning earth of the days. There were but few of what may be called trees. Only herbaceous plants, immense turfs, briars, Moseses, rare families, which, however, in those days were counted by tens and tens of thousands. It's entirely to this exuberant vegetation that coal owes its origin. The crush of the vast globe still yielded under the influence of the seething, boiling mass, which was forever at work beneath. <clears throat> Hence arose numerous fissures and continual falling in of the upper earth. The dense mass of plants being beneath the waters soon formed themselves into vast agglomerations. Then came about the action of natural chemistry. In the depths of the oceans, the vegetable mass at first became turf. Then, thanks to the influence of gases and subterranean fermentation, they underwent the complete process of mineralization. In this matter, in early days, were formed the vast and prodigious layers of coal, which in ever-increasing consumption most utterly use up in about three centuries more. If people do not find some more economic light than gas and some cheaper motive power than steam, all these reflections, the memories of my school studies, came to my mind while I gazed upon these mighty acute accumulations of coal, whose riches, however, are scarcely likely to be ever utilized. The working of these mines could only be carried out at an expense that would never yield a profit. The matter, however, is scarcely worthy consideration. 
when coal is scattered over the whole surface of the globe, within a few yards of the upper crust. As I looked at these untouched strata, therefore, I knew they would remain as long as the world lasts. While we still continued our journey, I alone forgot the length of the road by giving myself up wholly to these geological considerations. The temperature continued to be very much the same as while we were traveling amid the lava and the schists. On the other hand, my sense of smell was much affected by a very powerful odor. I immediately knew that the gallery was filled to overflowing with that dangerous gas the miners called fire damp, the explosion of which has caused such fearful and terrible accidents, making a hundred, hundred widows and hundreds of orphans at a single hour. Happily, we were to illumine our progress by means of the Ruhmkorff apparatus. If we had been so rash and prudent as to explore this gallery, torch in hand, a terrible explosion would have put an end to our travels, simply because no traveler would be left. Our excursion through this wondrous coal mine in the very bowels of the earth lasted until evening. My uncle was scarcely able to conceal his impatience and dissatisfaction at the road continuing still to advance to a horizontal direction. The darkness, dense and opaque a few yards in advance and in the rear, <coughs> rendered it impossible to make out what was the length of the gallery. For myself, I began to believe that it was simply interminable and would go on in the same manner for months. Suddenly, at six o'clock, we stood in front of a wall. To the right, to the left above, below, nowhere was there any passage. We had reached a spot where the rocks said in unmistakable accents, No thoroughfare. I stood stupefied. The guide simply folded his arms. My uncle was silent. Well, well, so much the better, cried my uncle at last. I now know what we are about. We are decidedly not upon the road followed by Sacknusum. All we have to do is to go back. Let us take one night's good rest, and before three days are over, I promise you, we shall have regained to the point where the gallery is divided. Yes, we may, if our strength lasts as long, I cried in a lamentable voice. And why not? Tomorrow, among us three, there will be not a drop of water. It is just gone. And your courage with it, my, said my uncle, speaking in a severe tone. What could I say? I turned round on my side, and from sheer exhaustion fell into a heavy sleep, disturbed by dreams of water. And I awoke unrefreshed. I would have bartered a diamond mine for a glass of pure spring water. <coughs> Should have got me some water <laughs> before. <laughs> Chapter 18. The Wrong Road. <laughs> Next day, our departure took place at a very early hour. There was no time for the least delay. According to my account, we had five days' hard work to get back to the place where the galleries divided. I can never tell all the sufferings we endure upon our return. My uncle bore them like a man who has been, get, been in the wrong, that is, with concentrated and suppressed anger. Hans, with all the resignation of his if, of his specific character, specific character, I I confess that I did nothing but complain and despair. I had no heart for this bad fortune, but there was one consolation: defeat at the outset would probably upset the whole journey. As I had expected from the first, our supply of water gave completely out on our first day's march. Our provision of liquids was reduced to our supply of skydam, but this horrible, nay, I will say it, this infernal liquid burnt the throat, and I could not even bear the sight of it. I found the temperature to be stifling. I was paralyzed with fatigue. More than once, I was about to fall insensible to the ground. The whole party then halted, and the worthy Icelander and my excellent uncle did their best to console and comfort me. I could, however, plainly see that my uncle was contending painfully against the extreme fatigues of our journey, and the awful torture generated by the absence of water. At length, 
A time came when I ceased to recollect anything, when all was one awful, hideous, frantic dream. At last, on Tuesday, the 7th of the month of July, after crawling on our hands and knees for many hours, more dead than alive, we reached the point of junction between the galleries. I lay like a log, an inert mass of human flesh, on the arid lava soil. It was then ten in the morning. Hans and my uncle, leaning against the wall, tried to nibble away at some pieces of biscuit, while deep groans and sighs escaped from my scorched and swollen lips. Then I fell off into a kind of deep lethargy. I presently, presently I felt my uncle approach and lift me up tenderly in his arms. Poor boy, I heard him say in a tone of deep commiseration. I was profoundly touched by these words, being by no such means accustomed to the signs of womanly weakness in the professor. I caught his trembling hands in mine and gave them a gentle pressure. He allowed me to do so without resistance, looking at me kindly all the time. His eyes were wet with tears. I then saw him take the gourd, which he wore at his side. To my surprise, or rather to my stupefaction, he placed it to my lips. Drink, my boy, he said. Was it possible my ears had not deceived me? Was my uncle mad? I looked at him with, a, with I am sure, quite an idiotic expression. I could not believe him. I, too, who much feared the con counteraction of disappointment. Drink, he said again. <laughs> had I heard it right? Before, however, I could ask myself the question a second time. A mouthful of water cooled my parched lips and throat. One mouthful, but I do believe it brought me back to life. I thanked my uncle by clasping my hands. My heart was too full to speak. Yes, he said. One mouthful of water, the very last. Do you hear, my boy? The very last. I have taken care of it at the bottom of my bottle as the apple of my eye. Twenty times, a hundred times, I have resisted the fearful desire to drink it. But, no, no. Harry, I saved it for you. My dear uncle, I exclaimed. And the big tears rolled down my hot and feverish cheeks. Yes, my poor boy, I knew that when you reached this place, this crossroad of the earth, you would fall down half dead, and I saved my last drop of water in order to restore you. Thanks, I cried. Thanks from my heart. As, li as little as my thirst was really quenched, I had nevertheless partially recovered my strength. The contracted muscles of my throat relaxed, and the inflammation of my lips in some measure subsided. At all events, I was able to speak. Well, I said, there can be no doubt now as to what we have to do. Water has utterly failed us. Our journey is therefore at an end. Let us return. While I spoke thus, my uncle evidently avoided my face. He held down his head. His eyes were turned in every possible direction but the right one. Yes, I continued, getting excited by my own words. We must go back to Sneffels. May heaven give us strength to enable us once more to revisit the light of day. Would that we now stood on the summit of the crater. Go back, said my uncle, speaking to himself. And must it be so? Go back, yes. And without losing a single moment, I cried vehemently. For some moments there was silence under that dark and gloomy vault. So, my dear Harry, said the professor in a very singular tone of voice. Those few drops of water have not sufficed to restore your energy and courage. Courage, I cried. I see that you are quite as downcast as before, and still give way to discouragement and despair. What, then, was made of, and what other projects were entering his fertile and audacious brain? You are not discouraged, sir? What? Give up just as we are on the verge of success, he cried. Never, never shall it be said that Professor Hardwig retreated. Then... We must make up our minds to perish, I cried with a helpless sigh. No, Harry, my boy, certainly not. Go, leave me. I am very far from desiring your death. 
Take Hans with you. I will go alone. You ask us to leave you? Leave me, I say. I have undertaken this dangerous and perilous adventure. I will carry it to the end, or I will never return to the service of Mother Earth. Go, Harry. Once more, I say to you, go. My uncle, as he spoke, was terribly excited. His voice, which before had been tender, almost womanly, became harsh and menacing. He appeared to be struggled with desperate energy against the impossible. I did not wish to abandon him at the bottom of that abyss, while, on the other hand, the instinct of preservation told me to fly. Meanwhile, our guide was looking on with profound calmness and indifference. He appeared to be an unconcerned party, and yet he perfectly well knew what was going on between us. Our gestures sufficiently indicated the different roads each wished to follow, and which each tried to influence the other to undertake. But Hans appeared not to take the slightest interest in what was really a question of life and death for us, but waited quite ready to obey the signal which would say go aloft or to resume his desperate journey into the interior of the earth. How then I wished with all my heart and soul that I could make him understand my words, my representations, my sighs and groans, the earnest assents in which I should have spoken would have convinced that cold, hard nature, those fearful, da fearful dangers and perils of which the solid guide had no idea. I would have pointed them out to him. I would have as it were, made him see and feel. Between us, we might have convinced the obstinate professor. If the worst had come to the worst, we could have compelled him to return to the summit of Sneffels. I quietly approached Hans. I caught his hand in mine. He never moved a muscle. I indicated to him the road to the top of the crater. He remained motionless. My panting form, my haggard countenance, must have indicated the extent of my sufferings. The Icelander shook his head and pointed to my uncle. Master, he said. The word is Icelandic as well as English. The master, I cried, beside myself with fury. Madman! No, I tell you, he is not the master of our lives. We must fly. We must drag him with us. Do you hear me? Do you understand me, I say? I have already explained that I held Hans by the arm. I tried to make him rise from his seat. I struggled with him and tried to force him away. My uncle now interposed. My good Henry, be calm, he said. You will obtain nothing from my devote follower. Therefore, listen to what I have to say. I folded my arms as well I could and looked my uncle full in the face. This wretched want of water he said, is the sole obstacle to the success of my project in the entire gallery made of lava, schist, and coal. It is true we found not one, more, one liquid molecule. It is quite possible that we may, we may be more fortunate in Western Tunnel. My sole reply was to shake my head with an air of deep incredulity. Listen to... Listen to me to the end, said the professor in his well-known lecturing voice. While you lay, lay yonder without life or motion, I undertook a reconnoitering journey into the on formation of the, this other gallery. I have discovered it goes directly downwards into the bowels of the earth, and in a few hours with, will take us to the old granite formation. In this we shall undoubtedly find in, innumerable springs, the nature of the rock makes this a, a mathematical certainty, and instinct agrees with logic to say that it is so. Now this is a, the serious proposition which I have to make to you. When Christopher Columbus asked of his men three days to discover the land of promise, his men, ill, terrified, and hopeless, yet gave him three days, and the new world was discovered. Now I, the Christopher Columbus of this subterranean region, only ask of you one more day. If, when that time has expired, I have not found the water of which we are in search, I swear to you, I will give up my mighty enterprise and return to the Earth's surface. 
Despite my irritation and despair, I knew how much it cost my uncle to make his prop- this proposition and to hold such conciliatory language. Under the circumstances, what could I do but yield? Well, I cried, let it be as you wish, and may heaven reward your super- superhuman energy. But as, unless we discover water, our hours are numbered, let us lose no time. But go ahead. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Well. Very good. There was some uh, lack of water there. Definitely Made me thirsty, too. Yeah. <laughs> there, I, I, was got, I was laughing at the, uh, there were several, several talk discussions of the weekly women. <laughs> gotta, gotta remember when this was written. <laughs> That's true product of its time in some places at least it wasn't That's true racist and terrible and yeah all the things Let's shauna see. and i've been watching bewitched and it's very oh. similar yeah. very similar yeah like the like the old ones Mm-hmm. yep 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 very much so 